Good morning, everybody. Uh, this is a short little video series on specifically on carrier based operation and underfills, but <clears throat> I'm going to try to tie it into a uh, much bigger topic, which is uh, endodontics on the whole. So later this year, I want to do a full series on endodontics broken up into the various um, executable aspects of, uh, of endodontics. But here, I really want to focus on <clears throat> gutta core gutta core being one of the many kinds of carrier based obturation. <clears throat> it might be important for us to quickly go over what are the kinds of obturation. We have carrier based obturation, which is essentially delivering gutta percha with a handle and a delivery uh, um, tool or a carrier. Um, they come in various forms. So it's carrier based obturation. Warm vertical, which is the most standard um, and probably the most utilized by the endodontist uh, method of obturation. Then we have cold lateral, which I don't understand why is still taught in dental schools, uh, but it is another method. So those are the three major categories of um, obturation. I, I apologize. There is a new one, single cone technique with bioceramic sealers. Uh, topic for another day. <clears throat> I want to stick to the, uh, the more standard and time tested methods of obturation. So coming back to carrier-based obturation, right now we use Guttacore. Guttacore is the third generation of carrier-based obturators from Densply Serona, formerly known as Tulsa Densply, and formerly known as Tulsa Endodontics. <coughs> so that company has taken many shapes and forms over the years. Currently, Densply Serona, division of endodontics. They make Guttacore, Wave 1, Pro Taper, so on and so forth. So, <coughs> When it comes to um, carrier-based obturators, <clears throat> let's quickly talk about what the, uh, the previous generations were. The first generation was called Thermophil. Thermophil was a plastic, sorry, a metal carrier uh, that had gutta percha around it. Looked very similar to the gutta core today, but the carrier was made of metal. Then they replaced the metal carrier with a plastic carrier. That plastic was gray. You may still see those in some offices. Um, and then fast forward to today, where we have the gutta percha carrier. It's cross-link gutta percha, so it's stiff compared to regular gutta percha, which is thermally softened. And we'll go over that in a moment. But that's the that's the generational advance of the carrier-based obturators from Densply Serona, Division of Endodontics. So, <clears throat> what we want to talk about today is is underfill specifically. So, before we go into this, I'm a huge proponent. Many of you that have had these conversations with me know that I firmly believe that anybody doing endodontics should have both of these skill sets. The two skill sets being carrier-based obturation, ideally gutta core, because it's the newest generation, and there's reasons why it's better than the previous generations, and then warm vertical methods. Endodontics or endodontists, the specialists, are still primarily using warm vertical. There are advantages to warm vertical. But I also believe there are advantages to carrier base obturation. I think having both of those skill sets is likely to maximize your clinical outcomes. If you only want to learn one, I firmly believe that carrier base obturation is not the one to learn. It does not cover all indications. You're likely to run into issues. Um, if you're going to learn one, learn warm vertical. I promise you it, there's reasons for that. And we'll go over that in later videos. But I want to specifically talk about underfills with gutta core. Okay, so that was kind of the history of this conversation. Here we are. I don't know. This image was taken off the internet. I don't know if this is specifically thermophil. I, I don't think it is <coughs> thermophil or gutta core. Uh, but it's just an underfill photo. So I want us to focus on this in specific reference to carrier base obturators. So before we get too far, I often, whenever I'm speaking, I, I often quote a comment that Jerry Kugel from, I believe he's either from Tufts or BC or uh, BU, um, a Boston school. He gave a lecture once and he talked and actually gave some references on how few dentists actually read the directions to things. And I know this is rather condescending, but as somebody who's found himself coaching and mentoring other dentists uh, and being a dentist myself, I know how few people read the directions. I can't tell you how many times I've read directions on a product I thought I was using right, only to find out that I was missing a step that probably has clinical 
relevance. Gutta core being one of those. And I promise you there's people watching this video that are going to learn three or four things from what I talk about. I know that because this is what got this whole conversation started. So here to help, <clears throat> but I can promise you every product you use, even if it's a similar product to one that you understood the directions of before, read the directions. Bonding agents being another very, very important aspect to our clinical day that really requires us to read the directions. A small variation in execution can have profound downstream effects to the clinical performance of what we do for our patients. So if you want, type in Guttacore clinical card or reference card, and this will pop up on Google if you want to read this in more detail. Uh, I'm sorry about the resolution here. It's not that great. But uh, what I did is I, I highlighted some of the things that I think will help us. Some of these are on the card. Some of them are not. These are just observations I've had. Either I've created these myself or through lectures, other people who are familiar with this system have shared insight. Number one is create a coronal flare. So if we're using wave one, if we're using gutta core, we're probably using wave one system, but really it doesn't matter. If we're using carrier based operators, when we go to put this in the canal, it's sometimes hard to see where we're going. So if we, if we flare the coronal one third, we increase the success of that gutta core carrier, um, not getting bound up on the floor. So if we flare the coronal one third, we increase the success rates. At least in my hands, this has been true. To flare the coronal, you can use Gates Glidden's, you can use the SX file, you can use a larger tapered wave one file. Uh, there's a whole host of ways of doing this. I personally like the SX file, but we've been noticing an increase in breakage of the SX files, um, but we haven't necessarily um, been using them correctly. So I don't want to blame the SX file. The SX file has a very specific way of using it. At no point should you be putting apical pressure on the SX file. If you do, you're likely to break it. So it's not the SX file, it's how it's used. <clears throat> it should be um, inserted to a depth where you start to feel resistance and then painting away from the furcation towards the outer uh, line angle of the tooth um, to create coronal opening. We'll dive into this more. I just want to start planting some seeds. The point is coronal flaring is helpful. Uh, passive size verifier. So for those of us who use gutta core, we know that there's something called the size verifier. It's a stainless steel file that matches the taper and uh, apical diameter or ISO diameter of the um, subsequent gutta core. It's a file and it seems like it'll cut but it's, it really doesn't. It doesn't with any sort of efficiency. Some claim that it does. But in general, you're just using this to place down into the canal and get a sense of, is it passive or not? This is your test run for the gutta core. Because with gutta core, you get one shot. If you can't get this down without, if you're placing it and you have resistance, then you should go back with your master file, whether that's wave one or pro taper. Uh, whatever file you're using and re-instrument several times and then try again. So if you can't get a size verifier down passively, you're not ready for gutta core obturation. So that's important point number two. Uh, there are times when the, um, the carrier will go down with some resistance, the paper points go down to length, but then you could do the gutta core because of the significant hydraulic pressure involved, uh, the gutta core doesn't go to length. So this is important point number one. If you're getting short fills with gutta core obturation, make sure that you're getting passive size verifiers. Um, this is not related to the performance of gutta core as far as short fills go, but probably more overfills. In general, <clears throat> there's something called apical control. Apical control is a term used in endodontics that says how um, ideal is the apical preparation for obturation. Poor apical control would mean you went five millimeters past with your, your files and you have a very large open apex over instrumented. That's poor apical control. Good apical control is where you have uh, a seat that prevents apical extrusion of things, files, gutta purchase, so on and so forth, um, that is of larger diameter than the apical constriction, at which point irrigants go and clean that area and we have a biological surface just beyond that. 
in general, <clears throat> if you have a working length that you're happy with, that you confirm with your apex locator in a radiograph, if you can extend a number 15 file past that working length, you don't have good apical control, which isn't the end of the world, but you no longer should be using gutta core. The likelihood of extruding gutta percha and or sealer past the apex because of the significant hydraulic pressure is great. So when you're all done, you've got your, your passive size verifier, take your number 15. If the 15 stops, then you have good apical control. It stops at your working length. If it goes past it, use warm vertical because warm vertical has much more apical control of obturation because the tip of the gutter percha is not heated like it is with gutter core. Another observation, this is in the directions, the stopper goes beneath the platform on the gutter core oven. So this is an example of a very simple direction that is very often overlooked. Um, I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on this. If you don't know what I'm saying, let me know and I'll, I'll walk you through it. Uh, in general, the stopper, this guy, well, I'll show you later. Um, the stopper, which measures the, the, the working length on the handle, needs to go below the platform on the gutta core oven. There are three settings for gutta core, one, two, and three. Gutta core, use setting one. Thermophil and other methods use two and three. Um, there are reasons why I use number two. Sometimes with the bigger handles, I'll use those because they heat up more. Uh, but in general, use setting number one. Um, not necessarily, well, yeah, th this can be relevant. So you're going to remove the handle, but the gutta percha hasn't hardened. If you go to remove the handle, you can actually pull backwards in a coronal sense the, um, the carrier, which can create short fills. So in general, when you're doing the obturation, make sure you cool it off and then get the handle off using a spoon and try to ensure that you're not putting any coronal back force so that you're, you're not pulling it out of the canal. Um, this is a huge one. The stopper goes below the measuring ring on the handle. I don't know why um, Densply did this. Uh, I've been to several lectures on this particular topic and nobody was able to really uh, definitively explain why they did this. Uh, at least where I went to dental school, they t I was always putting the stopper above the line uh, in carrier-based obturation, you're going to put it below the line. And, I, and I, I know kind of why, and we'll talk about it in a moment. Just know this is what the directions say, and this may or may not contribute to your working lengths being aberrant. And lastly, and most importantly, use the rings on the carrier to measure your working length, not external measuring tools. So don't use a perio probe or a measuring device like when we measure um, instrumentation files, we're often using some sort of tool to measure. We have to rely on the rings on the carrier. So that's where we come here. The rings are these guys here. All right. So Densply, um, their particular settings are 18, 19, and 20. Those are the three. That's true for all of their files. 22, 24, 27, and 29. <clears throat> Uh, use these, don't measure from the tip forward. And here's why. Inside of, so this image here, I put a little fake carrier. Uh, the carrier in the inside is the crosslink gutter percha. It's the more plasticky carrier. It's this guy here. And then it has a sheathing of regular gutter percha around it that when thermoplasticized has plasticity and is what is used to do our obturation. The point is there's a tip here of gutter percha and that tip may or may not make its way to the apex. In general, it doesn't, and it's actually not intended to, but really we're, we're really using the inner carrier to be the most apical extent of the obturation. This extra gutter percha is just meant to be an extra volume to help deliver on its way down to the more aberrant, aberrant areas. We know that, um, canal systems are not perfectly cylindrical. Um, they're very three-dimensional in sense, so this is just that extra gutter percha to get to those areas. But by the time you get down there, you're, this gutter percha is not there. So if you measure from the tip over and not use the rings, 
you're likely to have a short fill. And I, I forget what the average diameter here, not diameter, but the average length of this extra gutter perch is. I think it's on the order of a millimeter and a half to two millimeters. So if you're getting, you know, you, you do your operation or sorry, your instrumentation, all your working lengths look perfect. You're super confident. You go to Opterate and you get one of those short fills. Nine times out of 10 with this particular system, it's because of that. Use the rings, 18, 19, 20. Have the stopper go underneath the ring. So if we were measuring 20 here, that little line right here should be to the right of the stopper. If we were measuring 18, this stopper would be right here. And I think they do that to account for this extra piece here. I'm, I'm not sure, but I do know if you put the stopper underneath and you measure using the rings, uh, you're going to have good predictability. Again, that's what this is here. <clears throat> um, if nobody believes me, this comes from their website. Setting the working length, the calibration rings are at those measurements. Um, do not use a finger ruler to measure working distance as setting the working distance from the tip of gutter percha will be incorrect. That's the whole point of this particular um, video is I wanted to highlight this fact. Um, believe it or not, it's not in their directions. So <laughs> it's just amazing how um, askew the directions sometimes are to what clinically has to happen. That's why talking to other clinicians and going to seminars and conferences uh, does pay dividends in the long run uh, so that we can learn things like this to have profound clinical impact. And then lastly, clinical technique working length, set the top of the rubber stopper on the gutta core obturator to coincide with the working length established. All right, so the top of the stopper goes to the line that you're aiming for. If we do everything well, then we have fills that look something like this. So I hope this helps. Again, I'm going to put this into a more uh, comprehensive endodontic continuum for Nik the Nikkei channel. Uh, but I think with respect to obturation using gutta core, uh, I have no doubt there were things in here that might help increase your predictability. Uh, please let me know if you have any further questions and have a good weekend.